Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to Grace Bible Church Online. Our prayer is that our time in the Word together today continues to encourage and enrich your personal walk with Jesus Christ. While we're so honored that you chose to join us, we just wanted to take a moment to encourage you that this sermon video is merely a resource, one that is designed to make a deposit into your growing relationship with Jesus Christ, but is definitely not a worthy substitute of God's perfect design of you being connected to a local church where the gospel of Jesus is being preached and the word of God is being proclaimed. We believe that it's so important for every follower of Jesus to be connected to a live and in-person biblical community where the Lord can use you and your gifts to serve others while he uses the gifts that he expresses through others to serve you as well. While you are here, please take a moment and click the subscribe and like buttons and leave us a comment below. God bless you on your journey to grow in him and welcome to Grace Bible Church. I'm JJ, one of the pastors here, and uh, we honor the pastors, everybody else, welcome. Uh, we're going to take a little break from our worship and do a little what we call a state of grace, and then we'll continue to worship through our message uh, after that. Uh, we do state of grace because we, want, we don't have uh, business meetings, but we do like to keep you updated, hopefully quarterly, on uh, kind of where we are, where we're going, and kind of where we are financially, what's going on within uh, the church, and some wins and things we can celebrate together. Uh, we do have an open uh, door policy here at GBC. If you have questions about what you hear today, or you have additional questions about finance or where we're going or what's going on, how we spend the money, whatever, you can make an appointment with either myself or Marty Baker, uh, who is our director of administration, and we'll gladly sit down and talk with you about what, uh, how we do and what we do things and how we do things. So uh, that's an open door for you, an open invitation anytime you would like. I'd like to kind of start the state of grace with some wins uh, from thus far already inside of 20. Uh, 20, first quarter of 2020. Uh, we're coming off in January, our by 21 uh, days of prayer and fasting. Uh, within that, we had 15 churches participate with us as we, uh, as a county and beyond, uh, celebrated and sought uh, Jesus um, through 21 days of prayer and fasting. We're, we're excited about uh, that and what that is, and that's a big win uh, for the Capital C Church. We want to celebrate that with you uh, this morning. Also, uh, in quarter one of, of 2020, we've had 60 first-time guests. We just want to celebrate that as well because, yes, sir, yes, sir, we're going to celebrate that. Uh, as we welcome uh, imperfect people to encounter a perfect God, we want to make sure we are welcoming and having uh, new folks come in and experience, ultimately not GBC, but experiencing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and that's what is most important through all of this. Another win, uh, last week, Pastor Cameron introduced to you our discipleship process or discipleship strategy, the gather, go, and grow, the three environments in which we at GBC think it's important and how God has called us as a church uh, to disciple not just ourselves, but the nations. So uh, through that, uh, there are the gather, go, and grow environments, our gather, which is our large group environment, uh, some statistics, I can't even say it right now, some statistics uh, so far in quarter one, uh, our gather environment, which is our large group environment, we're averaging around 1445 in weekly attendance, our go, uh, which is our small group environments. Right now, uh, we have 13 small groups that are launched and, and going. And then our grow environment, which is our DNA, which is more intimate uh, time uh, uh, gathering together. As Pastor Cameron shared with you last week, we currently have 12 DNA groups meeting. And that's kind of our starting point. And we hope to celebrate more and more as we go through uh, out the year. I want to talk about generosity. Has anybody ever told you guys how generous you are? Well, let me tell you, you guys are generous folks. I just want to let you know that... Um, we did our Gift for Grace campaign this year, which was our, for our Benevolence Fund at Christmas. We did our special gift. What we, asked, we did was ask, we asked each individual adult to give $5, which would have given us around $5,000 for our uh, Benevolence Fund. Well, you guys were above and beyond that. You guys uh, offered, and we gave 5500 So you guys gave more than what we needed. So we know that that's what we need for this year. So thank you guys for your generosity. Also, in that same state of grace that I shared with you in November, we talked about how we were just under 1% under budget as far as receipts. Well, you guys came through for us once again and for the Lord. And uh, we ended 2019 just over 1% over budget uh, in as far as receipts. So thank you guys again for your generosity. Have I told you how generous you guys are? <laughs> already, already here in 2020, we've had three different missionaries come on, come on stage and with some big asks and some big needs that they have. Uh, we've had the, the Krenz family, which are part of um, Overland Missions, we've had uh, Cherry Remington in the Mission Haiti, and we had our Bahamas Relief Fund, and all those three things combined, you guys have uh, raised and, and given to those three organizations $30,884.
Have I told you how generous you guys are? Thank you so much for your generosity. I do want to talk to you about kind of where we are right now in our 2020 budget. Uh, this year's weekly budget requirement is $24,000 a week, which is exactly what it was last year. Again, we were right at 1%. We don't want to have any kind of major growth uh, inside of 2020. We're talking about our budget, so we're right there at the same place we were last year at $24,000 a week, which is roughly just over $1.2 million annual uh, budget. Where we currently stand uh, to date uh, on receipts is $22,886 weekly, which is roughly around 1% uh, plus or minus under weekly receipts. But remember how generous you guys are? That was a joke, but it wasn't a joke because you guys are generous folk. And so we know um, that God is going to continue to provide what we need when we need it when it's time for that to happen. I do want to talk to you about where we're going. Uh, in the November uh, State of Grace, I talked to you about our building campaign. The building has begun. As many of you may have noticed, as you try and walk around the circle, and there's a big yellow or orange fence that doesn't allow you to kind of walk where you want to walk, it's there now. The construction has begun, and we're so very excited. So phase one of construction is our upstairs project. It's going to have um, uh, more classrooms, a large group meeting space, as well as some additional offices that we need here at GBC. Uh, so you'll see some renderings of that on the, on the picture up there. That's the large group meeting space. Uh, phase two of the project is our children's center. Our goal is to build a two-story children's center next door that will house our birth through fifth grade students, our children, kids' life, all in the same building, trying to make it more convenient for the family, but also make it uh, a more central for, for everyone uh, within our children's ministry. There's going to be a new lobby area, a second story, and lots and lots of classrooms for our kids who have the opportunity to learn about Jesus in the language they understand. Thank you, parents, for bringing your kids to church. You know why we have to build that bigger children's center? Because y'all are bringing your kids to church. Yes, sir. Clap for yourselves. That's important. It's important for you as parents to bring your kids to church. But we now have to build a bigger building. So y'all keep having kids. We'll build a bigger building. And we'll just keep growing. It's important. Phase three will be a, a new lobby improvement. We'll, we'll enlarge our lobby area. We'll, um, we'll add to that. Uh, just kind of add into our welcoming environment as people come in uh, and welcome them to GBC. I uh, want to give you guys a, a phase one open house, if you will. After, directly after the service, uh, myself and some building team, member, team members will be out in the lobby and we'll gladly take you upstairs so you can kind of see where we are and where we started uh, phase one project. So uh, join us uh, after service. Uh, we'll be waiting there by the, stair, by the staircase in the middle of the lobby. And if you've never been upstairs, you're in for a treat. So. Hey, would you join me in thanking JJ for putting this uh, presentation together for us? <clears throat> And, uh, and all the work that goes on behind the scenes, JJ's our executive pastor, so you probably don't have as much face-to-face -face interactions with him because he's the one orchestrating everything, everything above, everything we do around here from behind the scenes with our administrative team. And um, you'll, you'll, you'll notice that JJ didn't talk dollars and cents yet. We are going to have that conversation, but since it's going to take more time to really talk about and roll out a capital campaign with these uh, different phases, we're going to talk about that again on April 5th. So make sure you write that on your calendar. Make sure you're here in person or watching online on April 5th so you'll know what the game plan is financially for making these three phases happen. Here's, here's what I will say. We do know the numbers. We have the numbers in, and we're chopping it up to see how we can best go about doing this. But one thing, the first and most important thing, is we are completely debt-free as a church, and we want to stay that way. Absolutely. And so... Um, yeah, this, this capital campaign will, will, will roll that out with in mind, not taking on any debt. I um, mean, we like to stay that way, and, and we're thankful that the Lord has allowed us to, to be at the place that we are. So uh, let's, let's pray together, prepare our hearts for the opening of God's Word, and pray about this stuff that is going on here at GBC. Lord, you are the most generous one. You gave of yourself. You poured yourself out completely. You paid it all so that we did not have any outstanding debt, so that we could be set free from the debt of sin that stood against us, Lord. And that was the highest price of all time. Thank you for giving your son that he might give up his life, that we might be made whole, and, be my, and that we might be reunited with you and made one again. Lord, we thank you for that gift, and we thank you for your love for us and how you continue to display your generosity through the people of GBC, not only to GBC, but also to the nations. Lord, and how we have partnered with ministries and missions around the world that are expressly furthering the gospel as the central theme of what they do. 
And Lord, thank you for connecting us together with them. I thank you for the folks of GBC that faithfully support this um, this church family and through this church family, so many other gospel center missions. Uh, Lord, have your way in us this morning as you prepare our hearts to hear from you. I don't want to waste these people's time by them hearing from me. God, they need to hear an utterance of the Holy Spirit that digs so deep inside of them that it continues to transform them into the likeness of Christ. I can't do that. Only you can. So, Lord, would you take over and turn the spotlights on you? Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear? And would you glorify your name? Would you lift up Jesus in our midst this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, what's up? How many of y'all were planning on being at the 830 service? That's what I want to know. And then you end up in here because you was late, late, late. I still got bags under my eyes. It was only one hour of sleep, but, I mean, it, it definitely kind of throws me off. I t- 830 service was real flat. Everybody just kind of sitting there staring at each other like during worship. They're just standing here like this. I'm like, hello, wake up, you know. When we get to heaven, we're going to be worshiping around the clock. You know what I'm saying? Hey, if you have your Bibles, flip on over to John chapter 12. Uh, we are embarking in a, a new sermon series discussion we're calling Road to the Cross. Now, uh, some of you that, that uh, for, for, the, for those of you that have grown up in a church environment, you may have went to a church that did like a Holy Week or a Passion Week. Um, whereas kind of the week leading up to Easter, you may have had church every night, um, and uh, you would preach kind of through those days leading up to the crucifixion, and that way on Sunday you were celebrating the resurrection. That's basically what we're doing, but we're spreading it out across weekends instead of coming here every night on a week. And so we're beginning this Road to the Cross discussion at Palm Sunday, okay? So this today is our Palm Sunday triumphal entry discussion as we take a close look at Jesus' life. If, you, if you're reading the scriptures and studying them, um, you'll notice that the book of John really focuses in just on the ministry of Jesus. It doesn't say as much about his childhood. Um, it really kind of dives in when he's about 30 years old and he's getting ready to go out and do gospel ministry. And so that, this is usually when I'm encouraging somebody that's new to the faith or has never really studied their Bible for themselves, and they say, well, where should I start? Should I start on page one? I say, no, no, don't do that, because then they'll run into the hurdles of Leviticus and Numbers and be thinking, what in the world is going on here? And so I tell people to start in the book of John. You know, this is the grand finale of God's love story for us. You get to see displayed in the book of John. So over these next um, weeks leading up to Easter, we'll be looking at, uh, primarily in the book of John, just looking at the, the highlights and the low points of Jesus' final week of earthly ministry before going to the cross to pay the ultimate price for our sins. And today we are going to be in John chapter 12. Now let me kind of set the the stage, a little backdrop for you, so you know where we're at in the story. Um, John chapter 12 um, is kind of entering into the life of Jesus right after he raises Lazarus from the dead. All right, so... Lazarus has just been raised from the dead. The rumors are traveling all throughout the known world that some guy got raised from the dead after having been dead for several days. This guy named Jesus did it, the so-called Messiah, this one that's claiming to be the Son of God, the King of Israel. Uh, Lazarus has been raised from the dead, and it just so happens that at this particular point in history, it is now um, time to celebrate the Passover, to observe the Passover. So what has happened is, Jews from all over the known world have now traveled to Jerusalem in preparation for this Passover time of celebration and the feasts that go along with it. And as they are entering into town, they are hearing about this guy named Lazarus that was raised from the dead by this guy named Jesus. And so this is an unprecedented, unparalleled season of excitement for Jewish people. There is some excitement in the air and all of Israel, and that's kind of where we jump in in chapter 12. Let's start in verse 9, now that you kind of know some of the backstory. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see who? Yeah, I would have wanted to also. You hear somebody got raised from the dead. I want to see that cat. So they go to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So the chief priests, which were like the the religious rulers, if you will, 
Um, the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. They wanted to kill Jesus. Now they also want to kill Lazarus because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Check that out. All these people traveling to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, still waiting on the Messiah when they met the resurrected Lazarus. Um, what, yeah. When they met the resurrected Lazarus, they're like, this Jesus guy must be the real deal. He must be the one that has been promised by the prophets. We'll dive in and look at that more in detail uh, later on in this conversation. So the next day, a large crowd, which that's an understatement, but a large crowd that had come to the feast, who had gathered from all over the known world, they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches off of palm trees. There's a lot of palm trees in Jerusalem. They took branches off of palm trees and they went out to meet him and they cried out saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Pay close attention. We'll circle back around to that in a few minutes. And Jesus found a young donkey, a colt, sat on it just as it was written. Verse 15 is a quote from Zechariah 9.9, and it says this, Fear not, daughter of Zion, which daughter of Zion is an ancient phrase that basically means people of, people of Jerusalem. Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, so after his resurrection, then they remembered all these things that had been written about him and had been done to him. Now the crowd who had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. So they were going throughout the city streets telling people the story of what they had experienced when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. Pay close attention to that. The crowd went out to meet Jesus because they had heard that he had done this sign, that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Just to give you an idea of like how many people were in town on this particular day, like the average census, like the average population of Jerusalem at that particular point in history was about 70,000 people. It's estimated that during this particular Passover, particularly with a few things that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes that were going on, there was a lot of people in Jerusalem. Their population went from about 70,000 to somewhere around 2.7 million. Okay, now we kind of get that in this culture down here in Highlands County because we go from about 60,000 people in the summer to a little over 100,000 people in the winter. So what used to take you seven minutes to drive from here to there now takes you seven minutes in the parking lot just to find a spot. Okay. Yeah. So we get the idea. We, we almost double in population when it's season here. So we kind of understand, but that's only a little over a hundred thousand people. We're talking about going from 70,000 about the population of Highlands County in the summer to 2.7 million. Can you imagine what that would be like here? It's mayhem. Every hotel is booked. Every restaurant is packed. There are people all out in the streets. It's just mayhem. There's that many people that have gathered to observe the time of Passover and to celebrate the feast, come and worship God. And as they arrive into town, there's another multitude of people that are already there, and they've been hearing the rumors spreading that Lazarus has been raised from the dead, and it was done by this guy named Jesus. Now, just to put some flesh and blood on this so you can kind of feel what 200 and something th or 2.7 million people feels like and sounds like. I want you to imagine like most of those people gathered at the mouth of the city when they heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So there's somewhere north of 2 million people that have just that are standing there looking down the dusty road waiting to see Jesus come side saddle on a donkey with his dusty fisherman. And they are roaring with excitement. Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Just to give you an idea of what that sounded like and what that feels like, let me, let me put this into modern terms for us, okay? The, the highest attended Beatles concert on record, the highest attended in their whole career, 55,000 people. Not even close to 2.7 million. The highest attended Taylor Swift concert 65,000 people. 
We're not even close yet. The highest attended country concert in the history of country music, Arlington, Texas, George Strait, 105,000 people. Not even close. Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I love Sinatra, man. <laughs> Old blue eyes. Frank Sinatra, his largest attending concert on record in history, Rio de Janeiro, 1980, 175,000 people. Okay, some of y'all who probably won't admit it, you were at Woodstock. Okay? <laughs> Woodstock in his prime, 1969. Some of y'all remember that. Some of y'all don't remember that, and you were there. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Woodstock, 1969, 400,000 people at its highest attended season. 400,000 people. 32 AD, downtown Jerusalem, Jesus on a donkey, 2.7 million. You feel it now? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the roar of a crowd that size shouting, Hosanna, save us, save us. Can you imagine the intensity? I mean, it was shaking that city with excitement. And there was, there was two major reasons why everybody was so jacked. Lazarus was one of those reasons. But I want to look through the reason why, like, these two there were two significant things that had culminated together on that particular day that were so big, never happened before, unprecedented and long awaited for, that had the people just stirring and buzzing with excitement. Part of it was seeing the fulfillment of Jesus fulfilling the prophets of old and, and all of these prophecies that have been fulfilled in Jesus' life. For, for example, um, Micah chapter 5 that was written over 730 years before the birth of Jesus said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Check. Okay, Genesis chapter 49 that was written 1,400 years before the birth of Jesus said that Messiah would be from the tribe of Judah. Check. Zechariah 9, 9, that was written 480 years before the birth of Jesus, said the Messiah would present himself riding on a donkey. Double check. Psalm chapter 22, written 600 years before the birth of Jesus, said that the Messiah would be tortured to death. Triple check. If you're a skeptic, by the way, which I know in... As many folks as come to GBC, like there are some of you that aren't followers of Jesus yet. There are some of you that are skeptical as to whether or not he was God. There are some of you that are skeptical because maybe you're Jewish. Maybe you're here and you're Jewish and you're still waiting on the Messiah. Maybe you're listening online and you're Jewish and you're still waiting on the Messiah. Like now would be a great time for you to tune in. Born in Bethlehem of the tribe of Judah. Came into the city riding on the donkey, Zechariah 9 9. All these prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before it ever happened. Psalm 22, he'd be tortured to death. That was 600 years before it happened. Daniel chapter 9, it was written 530 years before his birth, said that the Messiah would arrive before the destruction of the second temple. So Daniel gave us a season of which Jesus would arrive. Jesus was crucified like 32 AD. The second temple was destroyed about 70 A.D., so he met that as well. Triple check, 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 check. Isaiah gets very specific. Isaiah 52 and 53 for your afternoon reading pleasure. Go back and look at the specifics of Isaiah 52 and 53, and you're going to see that it was described that the Messiah's life would match a particular description, that he would, it would include suffering, he would be silent at his arrest, and while he was on trial... After his death, he would be buried in a rich man's tomb. While he was being crucified, none of his bones would be broken, which, by the way, was highly unusual. Usually the way that they finish people off, particularly if you got crucified on a Friday, because they had to make sure you were dead before the Sabbath on Saturday, they would usually come in and break your legs so that the weight of your body would eventually suffocate you. But Jesus, none of his bones were broken. There were some extraordinarily minute details that Isaiah shares Double check, triple check, not to mention over 350 other prophecies that were fulfilled in the life and ministry of Jesus. 
Nobody before him or since then has fulfilled that kind of Old Testament prophecy. This is the guy. But here's the problem. At that particular point in history, there were a lot of other self-proclaimed messiahs that had come and gone throughout that culture proclaiming to be the Son of God. Proclaiming to be the one that God had promised because they had read, they knew that this was the season, and so they had telling people that they were the guy. And so the modern-day rabbis in that particular time, they kind of upped the ante. And they said, all right, not only, because just by some coincidence, if somebody could fit that, that job description, born in Bethlehem, tribe of Judah, suffered and died on the cross, buried in a rich man's tomb, just in case somebody by accident fulfilled all of those criteria, we're going to stack some more on top of that. And I put this actually on the back of your bulletin so you could write these answers in if you're interested in keeping these notes. But to eliminate the issue of the many self-proclaimed messiahs of the time, rabbis of the day concluded that only, only the true messiah would be able to do these four very specific things. Thing number one, only the true messiah could heal a Jewish leper. You can read about that happening in the life of Jesus in Luke chapter 5. Only the true Messiah could heal a Jewish, specifically a Jewish leper. The second thing you can find in Matthew chapter 12, only the true Messiah could cast out a mute demon. You can read about that in Matthew chapter 12. A mute demon, specifically a demon that was causing somebody to be unable to speak. Jesus cast that out in Matthew chapter 12. So heal a Jewish leper, cast out a mute, mute demon. Number three, rabbis of the time concluded that only the true Messiah would be able to heal somebody that had been blind since birth. They had been blind their whole life. It's not like they had seen at some point something went wrong and then by some strange anomaly they got their sight back. This person had been blind since birth. Remember when Jesus had this conversation with his disciples? They came into the town, saw the guy on the side of the road. He had been blind since birth. And the disciples asked Jesus, hey, um, is this guy blind because of his sins or his parents' sins? And Jesus said, whoa, neither. This dude's blind because of the, the glory of God is about to be made known through this guy. And, th and this is why. Jesus knew that this was one of the, th one of the four things was that he would have to heal somebody that had been blind since birth. And so that happened in John chapter 9. Last but not least, the grand finale, the one that got the religious leaders of the day jacked up and really like started the time clock of them trying to kill Jesus was this grand finale was number four. Only the true Messiah would be able to raise somebody from the dead after three days. We read about that in John chapter 11, just a couple of pages before where we are this morning. John chapter 11, only the true Messiah could heal somebody, could raise somebody from the dead that has been dead for at least three days. Now, the reason why they had that specific number is because the ancient Hebrews believed that when you died, your soul remained with your body for a couple of days. So if somebody came back to life within that first 48 hours or so, um, they just assumed that, well, they must have been in a coma or something. And so this gives explanation for those of you that have read the story of uh, Lazarus and Jesus raising him from the dead. Do you, do you remember reading through that story, some of you? And Jesus was in another town, and he got word that Lazarus was dying. And, and the next verse is one of the most confusing verses in all the Bible. It says, Jesus heard that Lazarus was dying, so he hung out in that town for a couple of more days. And we're like, what are you doing? You can fix that. But yeah, Jesus kicks around town for a couple of more days before he goes and sees Lazarus. This is why. He had to make sure he was good and dead by that culture's standards before he raised him from the dead so that they would know that he was God. And when that happened, man, everybody got to talking. And the religious leaders turned up the heat to try to make sure they killed Jesus and they were after Lazarus. Lazarus went to the top of the hit list too because if people seeing Lazarus and seeing Jesus, they were turning from Judaism and they were following Jesus. They had traveled from all over the known world to come to Passover and do Jewish stuff. And then they see Jesus and Lazarus and they start following Jesus. How cool is that? To the tune of a couple mil. And so you can see while they were out at the city gate just cheering, save us, save us. This must be the guy. Not only has he fulfilled the Old Testament prophets, 
what they said about him, but he's also even fulfilled what the modern day rabbis are saying that he has to accomplish. Like nobody can do what he's done. This must be the guy. That was one of the things of great significance of what was happening that converged on this day. Now the other thing came out of one of the specific prophecies in Daniel chapter 9. I've taught about this before in great detail in years past, but let me just kind of sum it up. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel prophesied 500 years before this ever happened. Daniel prophesied that from the day of the decree until the day that the most holy one is anointed, so from the day of the decree to the day of the most holy one is anointed, there will be 77 year periods in between the two. So like you literally could sit down and do the math and figure out when the most holy one, when the Messiah was going to show up. And so if you sat down and do the math, and we broke this down on the screen before, and we've talked about it, it's been a few years, but let me just sum it up for you real quick. If we sat down and did the math, we would see that on March 14th, 445 BC, Nehemiah declares the decree. And then if you sat down and do the math, and you look at 77-year periods, which ends up being 173,880 days. Don't pull out your phone and check the math. Check it later. Because remember, you can't use a Gregorian calendar. We're 365 and a quarter days a year. Because every fourth year, we have a leap year. Jewish calendar is 360 days a year. So you got to figure it out on their calendar. Not to mention, every once in a while, they just throw in an extra month just for the heck of it to get caught up with the rest of the world. So when you sit down and do the Jewish math, 77-year periods from the day of the decree, March 14th, 445 BCE, and you fast forward 173,880 days, you land on April 6th, 32 AD, Sunday, the day that Jesus was coming into town. So these two significant things converged all at the same time. Not only had people circled that date on their calendar for over 500 years, that this is the day. That, maybe that's why there were so many people in Jerusalem that day. Because the promised Messiah is supposed to show up on Sunday, April 6th. We, we got to be there. And on top of that, as they're coming to town, they hear that this same Jesus that they've been hearing about has now raised somebody from the dead that's been dead for three days. Fulfilled all the Old Testament prophets, like, this has got to be the guy. Everything's pointing at Jesus as being the guy. And so everybody shows up to the tune of 2.7 million. They're at the mouth of the city as they see Jesus coming up side saddle on a donkey with his entourage of dusty fishermen. And they start shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Which, is a, which, by the way, was a typical greeting of anybody that was kind of a messenger of a servant of God. But did you notice what they ascribed to him? After they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see the next thing that they said about him, verse 13. They said, even the king of Israel. Two million people have just conferred upon him and ascribed to him kingship. And the religious of the leaders of the day had lost their mind. But these people just knew this had to be him. He's checked all the boxes. He showed up on the right day, at the right time, riding the right rental car. <laughs> this has got to be him. And so they shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us. Blessed is he who comes, even the king of Israel. Remember, it got so wild. When two million people are that excited, it got so wild. Remember the Pharisees in Luke chapter 18 that came up to Jesus and tried to get him to quiet his disciples? Remember in Jesus' response to the Pharisees, like, you can't quiet these people down. If you shut them up, even the rocks will cry out. Now, granted, God is very powerful, and he could probably put vocal cords in rocks, Reminds me of a song you sang growing up. Ain't no rock gonna cry in my place. Long as I'm alive, I'm gonna glorify his holy name. Some of y'all remember that one. Ain't no tree gonna lift its branches. Long as I'm alive, I'm gonna glorify his holy name. So maybe, maybe Jesus was saying, if you shut these people up, then the rocks are gonna start singing my praises. That's possible. 
God can do that. He did create us from dust. He can do whatever he wants, but that's probably not what he meant. He said, these two million people, they know what the prophets have said. They've seen the prophecy come true in front of their very eyes. They know that Lazarus has been raised from the dead. They know that I am king. And if you try to shut them up, the rocks are going to cry out. You're going to start a riot. So just let them praise. Now what's interesting is in that moment, the Pharisees could not quiet down the crowd because they were just celebrating and singing praises to Jesus as their coming king. But in less than five days later, the governor, Pontius Pilate, couldn't quiet the crowd either as the same people were shouting, crucify him. What happened? What happened? Everybody just knew that it was him. I mean, he had checked all the boxes. This has to be the Messiah, the promised one that we've been waiting for for generations. Finally, the one to come and save us is here. And then just three days later, like, the governor came to shut the people up as they're shouting, crucify him. He's a fraud. Kill him. He's another fake. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Jesus disappointed them. You know, they saw Jesus riding in, fulfilling the very words of God that have been spoken about him for thousands of years. And they just knew he had to be the one who was coming to set the captive free. And they remembered the words of Isaiah that we read at Christmas time when Isaiah says, And the government shall be on his shoulders. And to the end of his reign and his peace, there will be no end. And so when Jesus arrived, they celebrated that finally peace has come. And they waited one day, two days, three days. And Jesus was still just doing the things that Jesus had always done. Being with his disciples, ministering to people as he was coming and going, teaching the words of God and the ways of the kingdom. And he didn't start some political revolution like they had thought. And he didn't show up like the warrior king that they had hoped for to overthrow Rome. And so they shouted, crucify him. He must be a fraud. Because we believe that the true Messiah was going to come and was going to overthrow the powers of Rome and defeat Rome once and for all so that there could be peace on earth. But little did they know, Jesus didn't come to defeat Rome so that there could be peace on earth. Jesus came to defeat sin so that we could be at peace with God. And I'm so thankful that Jesus didn't answer the prayers that have been praying through a keyhole of faith and overthrow Rome so that the Jews of the ancient days 2,000 years ago could finally have peace in Rome. What a waste of the life of Christ that would have been. He didn't come defeat, to defeat Rome as our enemy. He came to defeat the greatest enemy of all time, sin, death, and the grave. He came to set us free that we might be free and be one with God once again because he was going to pay a penalty for our sins that we would never be able to afford to pay on our own. In other words, Jesus came to do more than we could have ever asked or imagined because at the extent of their imagination, all they could, all they could fathom was what Jesus was going to come and fix the Roman oppression problem 2,000 years ago. But he came to do greater things. And when I read the story of Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry and I see the people switch from Hosanna to crucify him in a matter of days, it always makes me kind of ask myself the question like, what is it that I am praying for and expecting in my life from God that I feel like he's disappointing me in? Because I'm wondering how many of you feel like you've been disappointed by God. You hear people get up and say, Lord, I'll never let you down. He's always faithful, but yet you could just start rattling off the list of all the ways you feel like God has let you down in your life. I wonder if you and me are like the people, the Jews that are in ancient Rome, and God hasn't let us down. Our expectations let us down. In other words, we had, we had assigned God a task as if he works for us. 
And as we were praying our prayers and we were having our conversations with other believers, we had assumed that we knew, like, God, if you're going to respond, if you're going to set us free, if you're going to show up and really fix things around here, then you're going to have to do it in this way right here. Otherwise, you're not loving and you're not faithful and maybe you don't even exist. I wonder how many of us in our prayers, we assign those roles to God. And when God doesn't answer the prayers that we want in the way that we want, we just assume either he's not even there or he can't possibly be loving. Are we no different than these ancient Jews that had already decided for God how he had to show up and what he had to do? That so quickly they were willing to stop singing his praises and now hurling insults at him. I know I've been there, and I bet you somebody is today too. But just like God loved them enough to not answer their prayer like they thought it should be, he is still the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he loves you enough to do what is best for you even when you cannot see it, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it rubs the grain against what you have decided would be the perfect case scenario, what has to absolutely happen for this thing to work out right. Jesus rolls up on his donkey, a symbol of peace, and not on his war horse. He rose up on a donkey, and he accomplishes more than you could ever ask or imagine. But just because you can't feel it and taste it and see it doesn't mean it isn't true and it isn't real. Look, we are the beneficiaries of it. Two million people switch sides just like that. And thanks to God's faithfulness, he went all the way to the cross and he didn't stop at defeating Rome so that we could be saved and set free too. I'm so thankful. And I'm reminded like... I oftentimes pray with the posture of my heart that I trust in myself and in my ways and in my words, and I tell God what I need him to do for me. But, beloved, I want to charge you with the beautiful words of Proverbs that say, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. I want to remind you that the God that you are calling out to, the Savior of the world, he is preeminent first place above all. And he is holding things together in his perfect plan, and his perfect strategy. And your life might be caught in the crossfire of that right now, but you can trust that what he is doing is good and it is beautiful and it is right and it is just and it is holy. Even though it doesn't feel like it all the time and it doesn't make sense. As a matter of fact, I want to ask the band to come back out here as we close in a time of worship. And before we do so, I actually want to... Flip over to Colossians chapter 1 as we are reminded of the beauty and the majesty and the magnitude of this Savior Jesus who has come for us to save us, that we can trust in him, that he's got it figured out. He is the image of the invisible God, this Jesus, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. Yes, they really do. And he is the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent, first place, top of the heap, A number one. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him... To reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I mean, he's already done more for us than we deserve. And we can trust in him with the everyday, ordinary, mundane things of life as we rest in him, knowing that he is working it out for his glory and for your good, even when it doesn't feel like it. Let's pray together. Well, we're fortunate to get, look back over, to get to look back over our shoulder and see the faithfulness of Jesus. But I bet if we were standing in the crowd that day, we would have felt betrayed too. And we would have felt let down. But God, you are faithful and you always have been. 
And as we take a close look at it today, we are reminded, Lord, that you had a bigger plan in mind. One that was gonna send ripple effects and echo throughout all of eternity. One that was gonna allow somebody like me, 2,000 years later, to turn to Jesus and be washed clean once and for all, for all time. Thank you for defeating my greatest enemy that I can rest in you as now I'm on the side of King Jesus. I am on your team. And for those that do not know you yet, God, I pray that they would press into the life-giving power of Jesus Christ, that you would transform them as you draw them into you and that you would rescue them from their unbelief. Only you can do that. So I ask that you would. We love you. Our life is yours. Our identity is yours. Our troubles are yours. Our weaknesses are yours. Our hurts are yours. The broken places in us are yours. Our victory is yours. Our success is yours. Our identity is yours. You are good. In Jesus' name.